Let's talk about another company that's had its fair share of growing pains. Let's talk about Uber. And a lot of you have probably heard the stories that essentially not the nicest place to work, a lot of harassment. It eventually came to the point where they had to get rid of uh, the founder, Kalanick. Uh, not only that, but Waymo sued them because they hired somebody who stole uh, information from Google, of all people. Yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, Kalanick joined uh, Trump's, uh, what is it, Ex executive board or business board, and 200,000 people dropped the app right after that, so he resigned. And not only that, but to top it all off, they knew that government regulators were riding on Uber to see what they were about and see if there was any violations. And so they found out who these people were and installed software to basically dump them off the app. <laughs> so the government couldn't see what there was going on. Uh, quite clearly, this also goes into the whole inner wisdom thing and everything else. Yeah. The interesting thing about Uber is they've raised like $24 billion. And yet, where has most of the money been that they've been raising recently? And where they've been raising their money is actually in debt. And why is that? Well, what they're planning on doing is going public. And when you go public, your stock is, is your gold. And so you're actually better off having debt than it is to lose shares. And so, what other things have they done? Well, they pissed off their drivers by focusing on autonomous vehicles. They've spread themselves way too thin, trying to cover everything on earth as Uber. Uh, they couldn't cut it in China and Russia and had to sell out. As it turns out, those, those might not have been the best acquisitions because they're losing uh, money. They got a guy from Expedia to take his place. They think Uber is worth $120 billion. We'll see. Uh, but they're not profitable. The thing is, Amazon and Facebook, by year five, they were cash flow positive. Uber is nine years old, and they still aren't cash flow positive. And so, uh, they thought they could go public this year, but as it turns out, with all the turmoil of debt and everything else, uh, Apple has lost 30% of its valuation. So now all of a sudden they're saying, well, you know, something may, if we don't go public, we'll be fine. And so, you know, how much more they, can they continue uh, to uh, borrow? Now, in terms of scaling, we talked about the three pillars. So the first one is product. And so what are the tools that'll help us be able to scale up and get bigger? Can we bring aboard the people that we need, whether there's skills and teamwork, and also, are the, can we put the processes in place where we'll get the coordination to work effectively? When we look at different products, and especially with regards to technology, I can categorize them into six different uh, types of technology. And so right now, I'm just going to go over in broad strokes, since so much of it is industry and company dependent. But in general, what are the things you look for in each of these uh, types of industries. So in terms of mechanical, materials is a big issue. Can you use cheap enough materials? Tools can be very expensive. These are the machines that actually build things. A lot of times these tools are custom. Custom tools are very expensive to make because they're one of a kind. This goes all the way back to economies of scale, meaning if you we're buying a lot of them, then yeah, the tool costs would go down. But when you're only buying a couple to test it out, because you're not going to do a whole production run on something untested, uh, it could be very expensive. And I used to design capital tools. Uh, labor, am I better off going with robots or am I better going off with people? And economies of scale, where am I going to break even? And so the entire chain from design all the way to packaging, these are the steps if I'm making something mechanical that I have to deal with, understand the cost, throughputs, and everything else. Uh, how am I going to do my customer support? Am I just going to have people go to chatbots, or are we going to actually talk to people? Marketing. In the early going, you are demo-driven. Guess what? These are tools that you can actually sell, but you can't sell them because you need them for marketing. And you will run into customers saying, how much would it cost me to buy that right now? And guess what? <laughs> uh, you can't. Uh, 
production, your volume sets your level of capability and how you're going to expand. And then you get into that whole fight over excess capacity or how much inventory do, do I build up or if I'm under, then I'm going to be losing money and I lose money either way. Are there regulatory issues I have to deal with, such as ISO, which is International Standards Organization, which is quality? Uh, I've been through an ISO development. Let me tell you, it is no fun. I mean, we had to write procedures for like putting on booties before going to counting areas. That's the level of detail that they want. And then finally, make versus buy. Uh, my secret sauce. In terms of devices and components, this is a big concept to understand. When I'm selling somebody a component, like I'm selling a graphics processor to uh, Dell, who's at, now Dell is paying me money for it, but in reality, the customer is my customer's customer. Dell isn't really my customer. It's the person buying the Dell computer where the cash actually goes to. And so how do you maintain your value uh, when you're just a component uh, that's uh, removed away from the paying customer. When you make devices and components, you need a lot of samples. A lot of times startups, you're doing onesie, twosie. You don't have those samples, so you don't have the credibility. Uh, making devices and components is about automation and tools. Uh, you make make versus buy decisions. What is it that is your secret sauce that you need to protect? Uh, not only that, but if it's not a specialized uh, function, then why are you reinventing the wheel? Uh, uh, you can expand capability by just outsourcing it. An example is when I was working on a closed loop control pump, I decided that, look, things like security, wireless security, is nothing special. We're just going to buy canned software. And the other team said, no, 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 it's got to be specialized or whatever. And so they had like a million lines of code. And uh, that device got recalled like five times because it was so buggy. And so that wasn't the secret sauce. The secret sauce was the algorithm uh, that actually delivered uh, medicine. Uh, you need to figure out how to get to cash quickly when you talk about devices and components. When are you going to get paid? And so you need a lot of upfront cash in order to make it work. The pharma industry. First and foremost, and it drives me crazy with biomedical startups, and I'm sure it kills Professor Kennedy, but first and foremost, you have to have a regulatory strategy. It's a regulatory-driven business. Uh, for pills, medicine, it could take up to a decade. You need patient investors. Uh, it's pretty funny. Senor Chavez said, no, I don't invest in that business. I'll never see my money again. <laughs> uh, when you talk about healthcare, you need to have people. Somebody like Pfizer actually has 4,000 salespeople. Uh, imagine how much that costs between salaries and bonuses and commissions and everything else. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but you need people. You can't do it digitally. This is why a lot of startups outsource their marketing to other companies that have excess capacity. And then that company decides whether or not they want to buy you out later on down the line. But they, people like Pfizer already have the salespeople. And they already have the connections in place. The thing about production on a lot of these, if it requires biological material, guess what? You have to culture them. It takes time. There isn't a way to speed it up. And so not only that, but you need the specialized equipment that can go ahead and do this. Uh, in terms of harvesting, the nature of biomedical is it's an acquisition business. Very few companies are able to make it to the billion dollar level. They normally get eaten. Uh, as you know, my wife has lupus and they told her about this wonder drug. First thing I did is when I found out that drug worked, I went and bought a boatload of shares. And guess what? They got cold feet and sold out. They were, they looked like a 10 bagger. And in the end, they only made like 15%. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a profit, but, you know, I want the 10 bagger. Uh, materials processes are typically done in batch, meaning you start out with a certain mass and then you end with a certain mass at the end. Uh, it doesn't uh, help you to just run a little bit because the cost is pretty much the same if you run a little bit or if you run a lot. 
It's, uh, there's a lot of places you can outsource to for batch processes. Experimentation in batch can be expensive. It could be anywhere from two and a half to 10K per run. Uh, when you have to outsource this stuff, you learn in a hurry how to be very, very careful with your runs. For example, uh, when I was at Michigan, I had my own lab. So I was doing four to five runs a month. Then you find out you only get four to five runs a year. All of a sudden, that totally changes your approach to development. Na naturally make versus buy decisions. Electronics is typically done with automated machinery. Uh, if you're going to do electronics, you're going to need software. Everything today runs off software. And so, uh, in terms of automation for this sort of thing, there are a lot of vendors available. And what drives a lot of this is your bomb, meaning your bill of materials. How much does it actually cost? It's the components that actually drive the cost. And there's huge economies of scale with the boards. Uh, but if you run a small number, running boards get expensive. It can be like $5,000 a pop. Uh, your packaging, it's something that you think, need to think about the design early. And that's a, it can actually be more expensive than the board. You have to do testing for robustness, like electromagnetic sensitivity, and you have to integrate all the pieces together. And it's not easy as it looks. Everybody thinks electronics is simple. Well, Microsoft, when they came out with their first Xbox, what did it do? It caught fire. And they thought, oh, it's easy to make a processor. Processors are energy hogs. And guess what? They heat up. And heating up excessively means fire. And that's exactly what happened, and it cost Microsoft a billion dollars just because they were arrogant and they didn't actually uh, refer to the people who, who do this for a living. So everybody in the packaging industry, and I know a lot of those people, they were all sitting around uh, laughing their asses off over the whole thing. Marketing. Essentially, how am I going to scale up my marketing? And so it's about what tools do I need, what people do I need, what processes and these are the big challenges that you need to be agile you need to share information and so based on my information how do I make decisions and respond to things so it's a loop uh, marketing is not cheap it adds up in a hurry and I've seen a lot of companies get toasted because they didn't have enough money for marketing every time you go out and market you have to be thinking about ROI meaning my cost of customer acquisition has to be at least three times, uh, I mean three times less than what I make in revenue. Uh, and I have to think about my buckets, essentially what market segments are going to drive me. And that starts to get into network theory and things like that, that you want positive fee forward. In terms of you as a company, what is your strategies? And it revolves around your management, your fundraising, and the processes that you put into place. One of the biggest problems startups have in the scaling up phase is anytime something's wrong, the solution is add another layer of management. Guess what? You've just created hierarchy. And so your problem isn't prob your management. It's more likely that you just don't have the processes in place to be able to handle it. Uh, in terms of digital and software, why has software become the biggest thing of all. Um, even though it's not mandatory at MIT, 95% of the students take a coding class. And it's because they realize that that's what the future is. And so because of cloud, mobile, and social, that's why software became so powerful. So in software, you're concerned about your development speed and also the cost of that. It always turns out you need more coders than you need. Uh, the hardware almost always finishes before the software. And the software, the guys are supposed to go faster. And that's like the complexity. Uh, you also have to make your software flexible, meaning is it going to be able to inter interface with other software? Do you have the capability? How often is your software available? Is it re always really going to be up 24-7? How are your users going to interface with it? And so now you're talking about speed and bandwidth. Uh, to give you an example, this is one of the big challenges of uh, mobile. And that's that if you have a delay of five seconds, uh, you're going to lose a, about half your people. They're just going to give up uh, because we're impatient or we're doing mobile. 
because mobile is about speed, about uh, being out and about, and so it's not the same experience as being in front of your desktop. Also, how are you going to put your quality and support together? Uh, that's something a lot of software people don't think about, and this is why you think about outsourcing this kind of stuff. But what it fundamentally comes down to is all of this put together reflects on your business goals. Uh, other things to consider is that when you go out and do your beta testing, how good you are is how well you can embed yourself into the customer to see exactly what they're doing with your work, what you need to change. Uh, do I want to outsource my work? Uh, am I going to use open source? Uh, how am I going to map out my software? And that's that there's a lot of pieces to it, whether it's the cost, how much, if I have new software, I'm going to have to invest in education or an education system for my customer. How am I going to do that? And then uh, what kind of journey am I going to take my users through my software? Uh, is it going to be nice and clean? Now you can credit your uh, fellow classmate George about this. I, I was aware of this and I hadn't really looked at it. And it uh, he actually posted on Canvas a really good article that you should read more about, but it's about blitz scaling, and that's the phenomenon right now in digital products, and that's that they believe that you need hyper growth. These are the Ubers and people like that who are billions and billions of dollars in debt, and yet people think it's okay. Snapchat hasn't made a profit. It's okay. Uh, and what it comes down to is you have to grab the high ground before somebody else is. You don't have the luxury of growing slow. And so they believe through network theory, whoever reaches scale first is the one who can dominate the market. And so you're emphasizing speed over efficiency. The merit to this idea, uh, and what's driven it, is that there's a lot of cheap cash out there. and. You know, has this been really a good thing? And the argument for blitz scaling is that other companies like Amazon and Facebook had to depend on this. And so when blitz scaling actually makes sense and work is first you need a humongous market, you know, the kind that you can make a hundred billion dollars at. Uh, do you have sustainable advantage? Uh, if I can reach scale before someone else, then I own the market. Uh, can I bootstrap? Essentially, can I tap on to other things or take advantage of other things? And so software, and P2P, distribution is easy to do uh, with this. Do I have the potential to have big margins? When you have small margins, um, it doesn't take much to basically tip you over. And in terms of profit, will I have positive cash flow when I reach scale? That was the biggest thing about Twitter. They're now profitable. The question is, can they grow? So the case for doing blitz scaling is it's too easy to enter this space. I mean, what's what's to prevent you from starting another Facebook? Uh, so it's since it's so easy to get into it, you need to stay ahead of the competition, and you can do that with cash. Airbnb use cash to beat back European competition, and so you want to also stay ahead before something happens. Like Uber, when at, <laughs> it's pretty funny, in the early going of Uber, Kalanick thought the company was illegal. <laughs> he knew something was going to come down. But if you go out there and establish it as a practice before legal comes in, then they're gonna see that, well, this is the way people do things, so okay, it's okay. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting an advantage. If you hit it hard and fast uh, and gain momentum, then the opposition can't catch up. Uh, there's a resistance to change. And to give you an example of how hard a game this is, uh, so Neil Paul was actually the real visionary of this P2P ride share. And he was working on it in 2000, but he couldn't get it to work because there were no smartphones. But he tread water, kept using uh, and it also had GPS problems, which is actually a very big part of uh, uh, these rideshare services. And so in 2012, he started SciCard. Uh, he raised 
million dollars. Logan Green, the founder of Lyft, who is inspired by Paul, uh, he believed also in the P2P economy, and he raised $2 billion. And then you know about Kalanick, and what was he driven by? Greed. <laughs> that this is a great opportunity to make money. But in 2015, he had raised $7.3 billion, and this is part of the reason uh, why Uber ended up winning. And also, they used a lot of questionable practices. Uh, is blitz scaling really necessary? Well, there's some things that didn't get quite right, and that the Amazon didn't use all that humongous VC money. Uh, what they did is they borrowed the money. And this is part of the, and when you borrow money, you don't uh, dilute the company, and this is why Bezos is the richest man in the world now. Uh, that's the way you do it. And so, uh, but Amazon, the one thing that, even when they weren't making money, the thing that was always attractive about them is the short time to cash. And so because they had a lot of cash around, investors like that. Facebook, they raised $2.3 before the IPO, and they were already profitable. Uh, the reason why they got all that extra cash is they wanted to hedge against risk, that if something went wrong and there was a rating day, they'd have the cash reserves in place. Uh, Google had raised $36 million before their IPO, and they also were also profitable. So they didn't need to do the blitz-scaling thing. The thing that's scary about all of this um, blitz-scaling and everything is, as you can see, 85% of the IPOs are companies losing money. I mean, is this healthy? And the worst part of all is this is real money. This is real investor dollars. And where are they all going? They're not going to the companies that can actually use it. And that's why it's so negative. And this is the valley. One thing about Silicon Valley is it's the trendiest place on earth. And when somebody's doing something, they're all lemmings to the sea. This is why in business school, and this was all the way back in the dot-com boom, back in uh, 2000, we said, we need to write a book. We're going to call it Silicon Valley Has No Strategy. <laughs> Uh, and right now, uh, before Silicon Valley, they were happy if they got a 10-bagger, meaning 10 times their investment. But now they have so many losers, they need more than a 10-bagger. They need like a 100-bagger. But your odds of hitting a unicorn are 0.07%. Not great. Uh, and so it's not enough to be successful. You have to win huge in order to make it worthwhile. And the problem is that sometimes this becomes a Ponzi scheme. And the only value of a stock is what somebody's willing to pay you for it because they're not turning a profit. Uh, and then you think, is this all there is? You know, just greed, just make money. Uh, well, MailChimp. And actually, I talked about MailChimp in my digital marketing class. Uh, they're an email service. And they've been profitable with $490 million from the first day from 12 million customers. How much money have they raised? <laughs> Well-run company. Atlassian, this project management software, they bootstrapped. They uh, tied into other sources. They lived off the land. Uh, and it wasn't until eight years later that they raised money. And that's mostly because they just wanted to scale faster. Uh, in a lot of Professor Chavez's classes, he talks about why you go into debt. So they did it the right time. Shutterstock, which you're all probably pretty familiar with, uh, they didn't take VC money until they became profitable, again, for growth. Uh, there are companies there that value people more. Basecamp, which is, again, project management software, they turn away work because they want to stay at a small 50-person company. Uh, Rx Bar, which is a health food bar, they were self-funded. Uh, They've gotten up to $130 million in revenue, and they sold to uh, Kellogg. Uh, the funniest thing is when these guys were getting started, they're like, oh, what VCs should we talk to? How should we raise money? And so then one of the founders talked to his dad, and he asked him for advice. And what was his advice to his son about raising money? You guys need to shut the fuck up and sell a thousand bars. <laughs> He's like, well, what's this all about raising money? Just go sell some stuff. 
Sage Father. <laughs> uh, there are companies that also are looking at a new way of investing instead of this whole negative earnings per share. What they do is they create convertible loans, meaning it could turn into stock or they could get paid back. And what they do is they're going after companies and basically giving the loans out against their uh, profitability. And so, as you can see, they've done quite well after investment, investing in these companies. And so, they're not looking uh, for profit-seeking company. Uh, they want profit-seeking companies, ugh, rather than exit companies. Uh -huh. So there is a big change to it. And this is called permissionless entrepreneurship. Now, one thing to think about, and this is what a lot of these businesses take for granted, with a platform or a network, the value comes from the users, not the platform itself. And when that ceases to happen, then a platform has no value. People forget they're the actual power in a platform. And so Bill Gates talked about that. Uh, Google. Google now, every time you click on something, it takes you to you know, Google Translate or something like that. Before, Google had software partners. This actually made for a more healthy internet. Now, what does Google drive you to? What Google does. They're creating monopoly. Is this really good for the internet? Let's see. The last part, I'm going to start talking about mechanics. And these are some of the specific things to do when you're looking at 